have a 20 minutes academic time. All right, I think we should go ahead and get started. And uh, welcome again to everyone here. You're with the War Industry Resistors Network. And uh, this is, I believe, this is our 25th webinar. We've been doing monthly webinars for over two years now. And uh, we're very happy to have with us Jeff Halper, who is an American Israeli citizen dual citizenship, living in Jerusalem. Many of you may know Jeff. He's well-published, well-spoken, been around for a while. I'll give him an introduction in a little while. But uh, before we get started, let me introduce, as always, uh, Paul Sannon with Max Peace Action, who's going to tell us a little bit about uh, the War Industry Resistors Network, just for those of you who are new to us and don't know who we are and what we do. So, Paul, please, over to you. Well, thank you, Ken. It's already, uh, it's wonderful to see already we have over 200 people on this webinar, and the number is going up. So this is great that we're all together to talk about these important topics. The War Industry Resistance Network is a network of groups around the country who have as their goal taking our country back from military contractors. The growing power of military contractors over our lives, our country, and our world is becoming clearer to more and more people each day. Today, we see the work of these military companies in Israel's war against Gaza. Lockheed, Raytheon, General Dynamics, Boeing, and the rest are right there in the middle of the havoc that their weapons, collaborations, trainings, and political support are bringing against Palestinians. What's encouraging is that we see more and more protests around the country targeting these companies, especially around the war in Gaza. And I'll just put a few links uh, in the chat, both to our website, but also to some of the, a few of these actions that have taken place focusing on Raytheon or General Dynamics or whatever, and their connections to the war. We encourage those on the call who are active around Gaza to expose the role of these companies in supporting Israel's onslaught and war crimes through weapons, servicing equipment, in pro-occupation narratives. But now let's take advantage of this wonderful opportunity that we have to hear Jeff Halper from Jerusalem talk about Israel's role in the global military industrial complex. Ken? Good, thank you, Paul. And uh, I noticed, Paul, that you put up the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal website also. And um, I'm going to add a link, a series of links there that is, um, I don't see the links. Uh, well, these are the sessions that they've had so far. Right. Um, they've had an opening session and four sessions. And if you go to our website, our Warren website, they're all listed there with a the link. Um, so know that. Okay. So, um, so as you know, tonight's session is about Israel and it's called um, How Does Israel Get Away With It? And uh, I know all of us are watching and uh, in, probably in grief and horror at the genocide happening in, in Gaza. And um, just, just to have a, a moment where we can um, hold the space for the people suffering in that genocide, let's, let us take just a, a moment of silence and, um, and hold those people in our hearts. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to now introduce Jeff Halper, 
Uh, he is an American-Israeli anthropologist. He's an author, lecturer, and political activist who's lived in Israel since 1973. He's the director of the Israeli Committee Against Home Demolitions, ECAD, and co-founder of the One Democratic State Campaign, ODSC. He self-identifies as a Jewish Israeli. So Jeff has written several books on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, one of which is this one. It's called The War on the People. And the title of our webinar tonight comes from the very first question Jeff asked in this book, which is, how does Israel get away with it? So tonight, I think Jeff's going to help us think about that and how they do get away with it. Uh, he also has a more recent book come out in 2021. This previous book came out in 2015. It's called Decolonizing Israel, Liberating Palestine, Zionism, Settler Colonialism, and the Case for One Democratic State. Jeff's a frequent writer and a speaker about Israeli politics, focusing mainly on nonviolent strategies to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He's a supporter of the BDS movement and the academic boycott of Israel and considers Israel to be guilty of apartheid and of a deliberate campaign to Judaize the occupied Palestinian territories. So we're very pleased to have you with us, Jeff. Please, over to you. Thank you very much, Ken. <clears throat> Thanks to Brian and Paul and uh, to all of you that have come. Um, you know, it's a very tough time, obviously, for all of us, and especially here in Palestine, Israel, with the um, with the ongoing war crime and crime against humanity that's going on in Gaza. Uh, my organization, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, uh, even in the first few days. Of, of this uh, of this war um, issued a statement. You can all, all look it up on our website, uh, ICAD, I-C-A-H-D dot org, in which we talk about genocide. In other words, we've gone beyond apartheid <laughs> and ethnic cleansing. Uh, and, uh, and we're talking about the genocide against the Palestinian people, not necessarily Gaza by itself. Gaza by itself is certainly a war crime wrapped in crimes against humanity. Um, whether Gaza itself yet rises to the level of, uh, of, of genocide remains to be seen. But what we try to do in our statements is to say, look, God, the whole issue of Gaza and, and Israel's attacks on Gaza didn't begin on October 7th. I mean, there's been vicious, violent, massive attacks regularly over the last uh, few decades. Gaza has been under complete siege for the last, six, last 16 years. And of course, Gaza is only a small piece of what's happened in general to the Palestinian people. So what we've said is that if you go back to 1947, 48, maybe even back to 1936, when the Zionist militias uh, cooperated with the British in terms of quelling the Palestinian revolt of those years, uh, what you really see is the destruction of the Palestinian people, the destruction of the people, massive killings of Palestinians, their dispersal, their displacement, the taking of their land, um, certainly cultural genocide, but way beyond that, I think what Israel has done, of which Gaza is a piece of it, but, but what Israel has done in the last 75 years or more does rise to the level of genocide. Uh, and I think it's very important that we uh, that we say that, that we try to act on that in terms of international courts, hold Israel accountable. Um, and I wanted to just say that as, as, a, as an introduction, because actually tonight's presentation doesn't really have that much to do with 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 the, the actual events of today and what's happening in Gaza, but rather more, as Ken said, a broader picture in terms of how does Israel get away with such outrages as what's happening now, not only get away with it, but enjoy the support of the American government, of the Europeans, uh, and so on. Uh, and that's what I'd like to address, but at the same time, it isn't only a matter of Israel itself, of course. What's significant is that the Israel is a part, and this is what I want to talk about tonight, uh, of the of the of the global capitalist system that we all live in, and in fact, Israel has really carved out a niche based on the Palestinian laboratory 
And Gaza, if anything, is a laboratory. I mean, there's all kinds of new weaponry today being tested and used for the first time in Gaza. There are some weapons that are still in the testing phase that, that, that are being used, not only Israeli weapons, but American weapons as well. Um, so, that, so that in a sense, the people of Gaza are only partially the, uh, the victims of what's happening. In fact, you know, the arms that are being developed in Gaza are for export, and they're going to get to you, both in military sense, but also, as I'll talk about, in a policing sense. So in a way, we can ask our, you know, you know, we, we, we should be aware of the fact that as our militaries and our security forces and our police forces become Israelized, which they are to a large degree because Israel um, is, really has this niche of population control and repression of populations, which is exactly what the, the G7 countries are not capable of doing, but what the capitalist system, the more repressive capitalist system every day, desperately needs. So there's a very strong niche for Israel. So as your militaries and police forces are being Israelized, we are all being Palestinianized. And I think this is a message for BDS and for all of us. We have to say to people in, in the United States or wherever you all are, that this isn't only an issue for Israel-Palestine wants. This isn't only an issue that affects Palestinians in particular, but this is really a global issue that affects all of us. In other words, what's happening to the Palestinians isn't something far away, and we should just be concerned because of their human rights and justice and so on, but rather this is really um, the laboratory um, for what's coming into your country. So what's happening to the Palestinians today is going to happen in one way or another, or is happening even in your own countries. Uh, and, and that's what I really want to talk about. So what I'd like to do is put, and what we have to do is put Israel within, within a global framework. I'm going to try to give an hour's lecture as quick as I can in a half an hour, assuming that a lot of you know, I'm not going to get into the whole capitalist uh, uh, thing. I mean, we all, I think, you know, we're all familiar with a lot of that, but nevertheless, to give it a kind of a context. So I want to try to, I, I want to do this in slides because I've always tried to visualize. I always think that visualizing and really nailing things down, like what is pacification, what is war against the people, and so on, is very helpful. So with your permission, I'm going to kind of either go to the side or disappear. And uh, I would like to share with you this uh, slide presentation. And then at the end, if I can get through it in time, uh, we'll have time. No, we, I will. And we'll have time for questions and answers. That's the plan. Jeff, I think you accidentally muted yourself. All right. Technology cooperating. So basically, we're living in a, I mean, again, I'm not going to get into this in depth, but in a pretty uh, uh, dismal, uh, advanced, late capitalist, neoliberal capitalist global system. And as we all know, the system is kind of beginning, to, is, is not kind, is, is closing down. The system is exhausting itself, uh, and, uh, and as it does so, and as more and more people become excluded, and as you have with the global neoliberalism, where 85% of the world's population uh, live on less than $10 a day, when 1% of the world's population controls 50% of the world's wealth, when we have climate change and resource wars, um, um, and all forms of insecurity, food insecurity, water insecurity, energy, and so on, uh, as the system begins to be more dystopic and begins to close down and more and more people are excluded, not only in the, in the third world, so-called, or in the global south, but also in the global south of the global north, and also our own kids, middle-class kids today, are being excluded from the job markets, 
um, have will not have the expectation of a life standard that that we've had. As this all begins to close down, uh, it the system has to become more repressive. And again, not only repressive towards its usual victims, who are the peoples of the global south and the poor people, but repressive towards everyone. I mean, the Occupy movement was a good example of uh, of the the massive sense of uh, of insecurity and outrage uh, and anger and suffering that middle class people are suffering in the United States and in the global north. So this sort of sets that stage for um, uh, you know this catastrophic convergence of all these factors that are happening, which make the military management of the capitalist system. Uh, imperative. In other words, capitalism always tried to go with a happy face. Ronald McDonald and Walt Disney and entertainment and consumerism and so on. But but as again, as resources become more scarce, um, uh, as there's more uh, unrest in the entire global system among the peoples, it has to become more repressive. And that's the context in which we have to understand Israel's role and how Israel gets away with it. So the um, uh, you know, so, so what we're talking about, what is this global system, of course, um, just to name them without getting into details, we have states themselves that are actors, um, especially the G7 states of the global north who are attempting to to rule the world. But states are in many ways, captive of or clients of the transnational corporations. And the transnational corporations are run by a transnational corporate class, what's called the TCC in, in the literature. So it isn't only a matter of American corporations or French corporations or British. This is a transnational network of corporations with interacting interlocking boards um, that are run by a transnational corporate class. So it general, genuinely is a, a, a global system dominated by the Western part of the global North, but nevertheless an, a, a transnational system. And in, and, and, and in this system, of course, the, uh, the military security industrial complex um, you know, is one of the most powerful parts of this transnational uh, a corporate uh, um, um, you know, interest group that pushes the policies of the states. Um, now, if we look at the world, this is a map that actually comes out of the Pentagon. And, uh, and this is the way the Pentagon views the world. The core is what we call the global north. You know, the core is especially the G7 nations but as you can see on this map a little bit, they include Russia, they include China. Um, in other words, what's called the emerging economies. Brazil is a part of it. South Africa is a part of this core in the sense of the, of the core of the capitalist system, but also strong capitalist countries that have been on the peripheries, but are now beginning to move in, in, in the BRICS countries in particular. BRICS, you know, Brazil, uh, India, uh, China um, and South Africa, um, and Russia uh, and others, but 85 percent of, of or not 80 not with with China, but uh, the groups we call the global South, the, the so-called developing world, what we call the third world, are in are in this uh, with, you know are in with uh, what the Pentagon is calling the non-integrating gap. In other words, from their point of view, this is the part of the world that will never integrate into the world system. The people living in these countries will never get education. They'll never get uh, important job skills. They'll never get out of the informal economy. 80% of the people in this non-integrating gap work in the informal economy, do not have formal jobs or wages or job security or, or a subsistence income. Um, and worse, none of the people really in this non-integrating gap are ever gonna be consumers. 
And so they're what the international system calls surplus humanity. They're simply expendable and we don't need them. And that's one reason, of course, why they're, it, it's so easy to wage war on them. Uh, and if you look at the map, it's interesting uh, what the Pentagon says that, um, that uh, if you look at number two, uh, we have to firewall off the core from the gap's worst exports. Now, what are the exports? I mean, you can read it here, but you know, they're not diamonds, they're not oil, they're not minerals, they're not wood and timber all these uh, uh, resources that flow to the, to, the, to the global north, no, they're pandemics, narcotics, and terror. Those are the only things the non-integrating gap is, is contributing uh, to the world, and therefore the core of the world has to firewall them off. And, uh, and if you look at number three, this is militarized management. We shrink the gap, not by not by bringing people into the global economy, not by bringing all these countries into, for example, uh, the World Bank and the IMF and the World Trade Organization and the UN and the Security Council. No, not by bringing their economies in, but rather by, uh, by export. We, the core, export security to the worst, and what are all these countries called? This is Trump language, security sinkhole. That's most of the world in the view of the Pentagon, or at least many of the people in the Pentagon. And so, you know, and, and in fact, this has a real, a real, uh, uh, a, a real presence, a physical presence. It, it, it's in fact a reality that's happening because if you look at the securitized borders in the world, the major borders that have been fenced off and walled off, and, and Israel, of course, is key to that, you can see that in sense the, the borders that are being, you know, that are being uh, 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 secured are really the borders that define. You know, if you go back and forth, it, it, it define. you know, if you look at the core and the non integrated this was a map made in the Pentagon. It had nothing to do with this was made a number of years ago, but if you compare it with the map of the actual borders between uh, between countries, in fact, this is really becoming an actualized fact on the ground. The idea of this of this global North Core, and again, Israel is one of the key components of this entire uh, uh, international effort to try to uh, to firewall. The, the core off against the non-integrating gap. Um, Israel is involved in almost all the projects of building walls. And again, based on its own experience in the Palestinian laboratory. Uh, and it's not only physical walls, of course, but, but the Israeli walls are very, are very uh, sophisticated. There's all kinds of sensors. We'll talk about this in a little while, automatic, uh, uh, guns that go off and, and all sorts of things. Um, but uh, the Elbit system, which is one of the, the key uh, uh, industries in Israel that deals with this, is very involved with Boeing, especially in terms of building the wall on the Mexican border uh, with, with the United States. A friend of mine who, who works with us, Jimmy Johnson, wrote an article that's called the Palestine-Mexico border. Uh, and so again, we see the Israeli, and this is just kind of a, a view of what the future is likely to look like with, with the global north uh, or the transnational corporate class and its managerial allies, and maybe a few of its skilled workers within these fortress cities, maybe fortress continents even, and everybody else then outside um, trying to eke out a living, including many of our own children, in my, from my point of view. And of course, this is all what David Harris calls accumulation by dispossession. That as the, uh, the capitalist system reaches its limits, in other words, capitalism always grew because it had new frontiers, it had new markets, there were jungles it could go into, there were, they were uh, 
areas where there were minerals that they could that they could mine. There were places where tourists could go that they had never been. That world, but the world is finite. And capitalism has really reached the limits of, of expanding and it's turning inward. It's basically imploding. And so the accumulation by dispossession that used to happen to other people in the ages of colonization are now coming into our own communities. And this is what's making uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this, um, uh, this implosion, you know, our own exclusion from the system uh, so felt today, you know, in the Occupy movement of, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, forms of, of dispossession that we're all experiencing. And again, you know, if, another way to, and resource wars are one of the main sources. Wars are no longer ideological. The vast majority of wars and the impetus to wars come over scarcity of resources and the need of the global north to ensure a smooth flow of, of these goods into, uh, into the global north markets themselves. Um, and so it's interesting if you look, if you again, keep in mind the map of the non-integrating gap, it, it conforms very closely to these reddish areas that have some of the world's most uh, valuable resources. So the same uh, 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 global south that's considered only the exporters of terrorism and narcotics and pandemics are in fact the exporters by force. They're being robbed and looted um, by the global north uh, that's, uh, that, uh, that's taking its, uh, its resources by force. Uh, and you can see the, again, the military management simply, you know, in terms of military expenditures. Um, the USA, uh, and its NATO allies um, account for 55% of the world's military uh, expenditures that reached this year $2.2 trillion. Uh, uh, and the United States has a, obviously the lion's share of military expenditure. If you add to that, as I write in here, you know, it's, it's, it's Pacific allies, Japan and South Korea, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, and Israel, uh, uh, NATO and the U.S. and its allies actually account for like 63% of the world's military expenditure. So it's very clear that, uh, you know, that the global north is invested militarily in keeping this system going. And this gets into what we call, uh, what I call uh, in my book, uh, you know, but it's in the literature, I didn't make up the, the term, Securocratic wars, uh, or everywhere wars. In other words, in other words, the wars are no longer for ideology. Uh, wars are for control, for pacification, because uh, because in a rest of world in which again the the resources uh, um, uh, have to flow smoothly into the global into the global north. Um, more and more, this is taking the form of what we call securocratic wars. Not only, as I'll talk about in a minute, the foreign wars, but wars that are domestic as well, uh, that our police forces are fighting. And this has to do with military operations that enforce uh, global domination in a very brutal, you know, obvious sense. And then war amongst the people, uh, you know, which is war against all of us that are trying to resist in one way or another, um, you know, being victimized by the capitalist system or excluded. And of course, a, also a, a security-based governmentality. In other words, in other words uh, security is becoming maybe the key word, certainly in Israel, but I think in the United States and other places as well. Everything is about security because there's a tremendous insecurity not only in the system but the insecurity is also um is also um uh, uh encouraged by the uh the sense of insecurity it's encouraged by the uh, by the ruling classes uh, because if it's security then it's presented as something that's neutral you know security we're all in danger and therefore when i go to the airport i take off my shoes myself nobody has to ask me 
You know, I take my computer out of the bag. Why in the 21st century do you have to take a computer out of a computer case? You don't. All the airport, all the airline executives say that should be that should be a dis, discontinued that practice. It, it's absolutely unnecessary, but it's done because it it adds to our uh, not only to our feeling of insecurity, but to our cooperation in securitizing ourselves. And what I want to suggest in a minute is that if we, you know, security sounds great. Everybody wants to be secure. But what if we replace the word security with the word pacification? Because in, in effect, that's where the system is going. It's trying to pacify us. Um, if we replace the word security by pacification, it would be kind of different. I want to be secure. Do I want to be pacified? You see, so, so uh, uh, these concepts, these mechanisms, um, you know, are, are thought out and they're a part of the system um, that, of course, enforce then the hegemony of the ruling classes. And again, the whole point of the system, and this is really where Israel is the expert, I think, globally, is to pacify the world's community, to pacify all of us who are not part of the ruling classes. And uh, in the capitalist world system, we see all the ways in which that's done. Uh, and we get to pacification. What does pacification mean? I think it's a term that we have to use more. Um, there's some very good people writing, Mark Neoclius in the UK, um, um, uh, George uh, at Carleton uh, University in Canada. I, I'm, I'm blanking on his last name, but there's a whole group called the Anti-Security Group. And, and uh, they're really trying to develop this idea of pacification, because this is really, if we want to communicate to the public, um, not only in terms of the terrible things military corporations are doing and our money and everything else, but in terms of what's happening to us, pacification is the key term. And pacification, as you can see here, it's a global project of fabricating a social order that's conducive to capitalist accumulation. In other words, trying to create a social order that we all live in in the world, uh, a global society, a global order in which we are acting in, in, in accordance with the needs of capitalist accumulation, or at least we're neutralized in terms of preventing capitalist accumulation. Pacification is a form of governmentality, a form of, of ruling us that suppresses opposition to the point where resistance is impossible. We can protest maybe here and there, but effective resistance becomes impossible. Pacification secures the insecurity of capitalism that's built in. I mean, capitalism is insecure. Every time you work for a boss or you can lose your job or you have no control, as Marx would say, over the modes of production, you're insecure, obviously. But again, it's it's exaggerated and 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 it's fed to us this insecurity in order to control us. Um, and pacification secures the insecurity of capitalism, especially as the system declines and becomes more more repressive. Pacification requires that the authorities know everything. And here's where surveillance comes in that we'll talk about in a few minutes. In a security state, Israel is a security state. It defines itself as a security state. And what it's trying to do with the United States and other European countries is export not only its weaponry, not only its strategies and tactics to population control um, and its technologies of repression, it's exporting the idea of a security state. Israel is saying to the United States, democracy is great, but you have to put a priority on security. And then you can have a democracy. And we'll talk about what that means in a, in, a, in a couple of minutes. And in a security state, there are no unexceptional spaces. In other words, no private spaces, you know, outside of the public gaze. And there are no spaces of anonymity. And here's where surveillance really becomes key. Uh, 
And finally, pacification relies on our own self-pacification, right? Um, laws, values, desires, again, that, that make, our, make us act and behave in ways conducive to the capitalist system. And that goes back a little bit to the idea of taking off our shoes uh, in the airport. We're self-pacifying ourselves. And, 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 and we're kind of assuming that, yeah, well, this system really makes sense because, yes, you know, there is insecurity and I want to be safe. And so I, I end up uh, accepting that whole system instead of questioning it or resisting it. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and the fact that in the airport there's zero tolerance kind of shows that in these, in these instances where we're confronted with a choice, do we self pass by or not? The government and the police say, if you don't, if you even, if you, there's signs in airports, if you joke about, you know, having a bomb in your pocket, you'll get arrested. So, you know, it's enforced. It's self pacification, but it's enforced. Uh, and this is what I call a global matrix of control, securocratic warfare. In other words, warfare that comes to pacify us and secure uh, everything for the capitalist uh, uh, accumulation process is happening in a global battle space. And this is important. We don't talk about anymore in armies, really about battlefields. There are very few battles. We'll talk in a second about there's very few conventional wars. And so the entire world is a battle space. That's the terminology that armies use today. And Asheville, North Carolina, is a part of the battle space as much as Gaza is, you see? And it's the same technologies and the same logics and the same intents. Um, and that creates what I call a, 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 you know, a global pacification system that's based on, I, I gave a cute name, <laughs> a missile complex, you know? Uh, that, that's a military internal security uh, surveillance, intelligence, and law enforcement. So this links the international, the military outside with law enforcement and policing inside. And this is kind of a, just a, uh, a visual of the global battle space. I think this is another term that we should begin to, to, adapt, to, adapt, to adopt because it links us to, for example, the people of Gaza or the Congo or the people of, uh, of Afghanistan, uh, or wherever. We're all within the same battle space in which, in which uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're being attacked by. We're the enemy, in a sense, in this battle space if we try to resist um, uh, this capitalist system. And you could see it very clearly in the American uh, deployment militarily in the world. The entire world is divided into uh, into uh, commands. For, you know, all right, there's a European command, a central command in the Middle East, African command, and so on. What's interesting is until 9-11, there was no North American command. That began with 9-11. So that, so that um, the people in the United States are also under an American military command, just like the rest of the people of, of the world, in case you thought you were exceptional. And this is just kind of a, all right, I'm not going to get into this, but how this international system of corporations and states and transnational elites and the supranational institutions like the World Bank and IMF and NATO and, and so on, uh, police the world. You know, they police, you know, one form of uh, of uh, global pacification is uh, policing the world against this restive surplus humanity. That's about 80 to 85% of the world's population. There's also wars for profit, of course, for securing resources, for securing capital flow, militarized accumulation of all these resources, and the arms trade itself, which is a, a $2.2 trillion industry, which isn't so bad. And then there's wars of empire maintenance, you know, where the United States, what I call horizontal wars against kind of peers, 
like the United States against Russia, the United States against China, uh, the United States against the BRICS alliance now, where Biden has announced this uh, India-Middle East corridor to counteract the Chinese belt and, and road system and so on. So these are all kinds of wars at different sorts of levels. Now, this is important. And I, I just want to get into this for a couple minutes. And that is that, again, we're fighting securocratic wars. Um, we're not fighting interstate wars anymore. The last, the last interstate war, conventional war, that involved two or more major powers directly was a Korean War. That was uh, 70 some years ago. There's been other interstate wars, smaller wars. I mean, the Ukraine war today, the Iran-Iraq war, for example, India-Pakistan. I mean, there have been interstate, but none that, that involve two or more of the major powers. So in effect, in effect, those kinds of wars, because of the, of the power of the weaponry, are sort of uh, irrelevant or, or dated or whatever. And what we're talking about today are, are, are uh, securocratic wars. Uh, there's either wars, um, um, as you can see here, um, asymmetric wars abroad, like high intensity operations, as they're called. I mean, these are all military terminologies, or civil wars, interstate conflicts, uh, and then beginning to shade into asymmetric wars abroad. I mean, I would call the militarized policing that you have in the United States an internal domestic war. You know, the police are not our friends, unfortunately. They're the agents of the state. Uh, and and uh, and uh, they're they're the enforcers uh, of the system, and therefore we have to kind of see this 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 military policing uh, uh, relationship. So you begin to grade into irregular warfare, counterinsurgency, and then homeland security. Again, with 9/11, for the first time, you have a homeland security idea. You know, and and department, which is today, I think, one of the largest, if not the largest, in the American government, and then getting into policing, discipline, prisons, and so on. What's interesting here, just just to note, is that in conventional wars, you know, we always think about wars in terms of tanks and uh, submarines and uh, jet aircraft and so on. Um, and in fact, those are the kinds of weapons the Pentagon is still producing. The F-35 is a trillion dollar uh, stealth uh, bomber, but it's irrelevant to wars against the people, as the United States discovered in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq and Somalia and other places. So that, so that the weaponry that the United States and Europe have doesn't help them in wars against the people. Um, and that's where Israel comes in, because Israel's been fighting a war against the Palestinian people for the last hundred years. But what's interesting here is that then in conventional warfare, there's really three phases of war. This is according to military doctrine. This is how military people would define conventional war. You have the intelligence at the beginning. I mean, they're not making the decisions of whether to go to war or not. That's political. But simply from a military point of view, when you start a war, you start with intelligence. So you know how the war should be initiated. Uh, maybe should it be, should you advise to initiate it or not? How are you going to conduct it and so on? And then secondly, you actually initiate and prosecute the war. And the third phase is victory. We win. I mean, every conventional war has to end in a victory. That's, that's the whole point of a conventional war. And then there is what's called a phase four, but the militaries don't relate to those because after victory, they lose interest. And that's why the United States got so messed up in Iraq because they had shock and awe. They did the three. I mean, you know, we remember Bush on the, on the aircraft carrier declaring victory because they had a, a victory within a few days. It wasn't hard to beat the Iraqi army, but phase four, what then what is what defeated them. And phase four, as you can see down below, 
is what securocratic war is all about. And that is pacification. Wars against the people are total wars. They're open-ended wars. They, they last for, because they have to do with pacification uh, of populations. And so, and so, and so in a sense, they're, they're very different kinds of wars because what's, what's the, the kind of the afterthought of a conventional war becomes the focus of securocratic wars. How do you control people permanently? Uh, and, and this has to do again, uh, the war against the people, and I'll, yeah, I, I'm gonna end in a, in a couple of minutes. I just wanna bring Israel in as well. I hope, Ken, am I going on too long? I told you to kick me under the table. No. You're fine, Jeff. Carry on, brother. All right, all right. Just for a, a few more minutes, because I, 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 there's so much to say, but I'm trying to. All right. <clears throat> At any rate, there is a concept in the army, um, the American army, well, the, the, in NATO, that's called war amongst the people, not a, amongst the people. And and in a sense, uh, it defines what I call war against the people. It's amongst because the military simply seizes the technical thing. You know, this is the situation we're fighting in. But if we put it within the, the wider political context that the military doesn't do, then it becomes obviously we're waging the wars against uh, the people. But the principles are the same. And there's a general you can see on the bottom named Rupert Smith, who's a British general who wrote a very interesting book called The Utility of Force in which he talks about war amongst the people as the new paradigm of warfare. His wife, by the way, is Israeli. So I don't know if that has anything to do with his military strategies, but this is the way he defines a war amongst the people that I, again, think is a good definition of war against the people. And he says the ends for which we fight are, uh, are changing from the absolute objectives of interstate war that I mentioned, phases one, two, three to victory, to more malleable objectives. That's phase four. You don't know what happens the day after. You don't know, and and that, but that's beginning to be more of a concern for militaries today. Malleable objectives. That's pretty different from victory, right? Having to do with individual societies that are not states. And this is the people. We fight amongst the people. This is what General Smith is telling us. Uh, uh, our conflicts tend to be timeless. Since we're seeking a condition, you see, we're not seeking victory, a condition. The condition is pacification. Uh, he doesn't say that, but that's a condition which has to be maintained, which may take, he says, years or decades. So this is indeed timeless because, like the Palestinians, this is what Israeli, Israel discovered, no matter how many victories it's had, how overwhelming its forces in Gaza, Palestinians, peoples under oppression, cannot accept the, the oppression. They're going to resist. And therefore, this idea of seeking a condition of pacification is, is something that is indeed timeless. And, and he puts the emphasis on phase four war warfare, which is stabilization and securitization. Um, and he doesn't use the term, but he's talking about securocratic wars. He says, we fight so as not to lose the force. We're not fighting to win, which is interesting. In the new situation, we're fighting to achieve dominance or project power. I mean, you could certainly see that in Gaza. I mean, what, what is this, this, this disproportionate destruction of Gaza all about? It's to project power, to break the will of the people uh, to fight. Shock and awe, as Rumfeld, Rumsfeld calls it. We fight so as not, it, it, the, and the tools of industrial war, think F-35s, are often irrelevant to war amongst the people. All right, well, if you don't have those tools, what do you do? 
Well, you have to look for somebody like Israel that does have the right tools. And they, and, and they begin to fill a very important niche. And that begins to explain how it gets away with it in this system. Uh, and finally, the sides we fight are mostly non-state again. And he's talking about asymmetrical warfare. And now we get to Israel, finally. And, and here's where Israel really has a very pivotal position in this whole, uh, in, in this whole global uh, militarized, managed world system that we live in. Uh, because Israel really is at the center of, of all kinds of, uh, of um, well, look, I mean, Israel is very strong with the major powers. It's, it's formally a strategic ally of the United States. By treaty, the United States is obliged to protect Israel. Uh, but it's also an associate member of NATO. And all its military uh, uh, weaponry and so on are cross-operational with NATO, with NATO weaponry. It's, but it, Israel is also very close to China. You know, Israel is the number two arms supplier to China. Israel is the number two arms supplier to India. So it doesn't have all its bath, all its eggs in the American or, or, glo or, or global north basket. It's, in, it, it's working with major powers. It's really spreading, it's hedging its bets in a sense. But Israel's also in touch with all kinds of local hegemons because enforcement from the, the, the niche of Israeli enforcement, we'll talk about this, isn't only global, of course, it's also localized. Israel sells a lot of its weaponry, but especially its technologies of repression and surveillance technologies to repressive regimes all over the world. Israel is involved in Equatorial Guiana. I don't think the United States has ever heard of Equatorial Guiana, but it's a vote in the UN. So, you know, because part of, of course, Israel's agenda is to get enough international support that it can maintain its occupation and its uh, the apartheid regime that it's, that it's growing so that it's very much in touch with local hegemons. Israel is very good at conventional warfare. It's fought five conventional wars. It has, it has five nuclear capable submarines. Israel has more nuclear capable submarines than China does. Uh, Israel's gotten a, 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 um, a, a supply of F-35s that are still in the testing phase they haven't come into the American Air Force yet. Uh, in other words, the most sophisticated, and Israel, of course, supplies very high, high, uh, high tech uh, 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 components to these uh, to these uh, conventional warfare uh, weaponry. But at the same time, on the other side, Israel is an expert on the war against the people because of the Palestinian laboratory and its war with the Palestinians all these years. Israel is very, very good uh, at, at using and developing high-tech weapons and tactics, but at the same time with very field-friendly weapons and tactics. So in many ways, Israel is at that pivot point that very few other countries have between sophisticated weaponry and, and, and knowledge of conventional warfare, but at the same time on the ground, in the global south with the repressive governments um, and giving them the kinds of technologies of repression that they need. Uh, and I'm not going to get into all, but it, basically Israel has three niches uh, in this global system. One is the development of high-tech weapon systems. The second is securitization and population control. And the third is, uh, I won't get into this right now, Hasbara helping governments like the American government frame what's going on in a way that it's sellable. Um, okay. um, all right. <clears throat> and you can see, I mean, this map is just suggestive. I can't put on one map, but it's just suggestive in terms of Israel's reach militarily. Um, Israel has military contracts with 190 countries out of 194 that are members of the UN. 
So, so uh, countries that have no diplomatic relations with Israel have, um, have uh, military relations with Israel. And it's everything from, again, supplying the US and NATO and working. For example, Israel is uh, developing the, the European uh, drone called the Watchkeeper is an Israeli drone that's being adapted for, for, for European and NATO and NATO uses. But Israel is also a very um, uh, involved, I mean, everywhere in the world, as I, as I mentioned, in China, in India, um, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, all right, I'll come back. There's something else I'll come back to in a second. Anyway, and what I'm saying is, look, the United States, has bases in 174 countries or so. All right. I mean, I mean, hard to, hard to say that Israel has more global reach militarily than the United States does, but I would argue that. You know, all right, yeah, bases, but what what the bases are fairly self-contained. They have their McDonald's and so on. And every once in a while they fly out and attack somebody, the American Air Force, and flies back or or whatever. Israel has no Israel has two military bases. That's it. Abroad. Both in Muslim countries, interestingly enough. One in Azerbaijan, which is a a, a, a jumping off point to Iran, right? And that's actually where Israel launches uh, most of its, its, its surveillance uh, spy satellites from Azerbaijan. But at the same time, but Israel also has a base in Eritrea, which is probably the most repressive government in the world, Eritrea, but it has an island that has an Israeli military base. Otherwise, no bases. But Israel, again, is supplying to countries all over the world, including countries the United States won't supply, like Myanmar, for example. Uh, and Israel is not only, again, on the military level, but it's embedded in the presidential guard, in the security services, and in the local police force. Plus, Israeli mercenaries are working all over the world. There was a battle in Colombia between the Colombian government, the drug cartels, and, uh, and, um, uh, and some local militias in which there were Israeli mercenaries training all three sides that came together in a battle. And all those mercenaries, Israeli mercenaries, were hired by the same company. I mean, uh, some of the greatest, some of the most important, if you read Andrew Feinstein's book, which is, I'm sure you know, uh, Shadow World, about the world's arms dealers, uh, the most powerful ones are located in Israel. So that, so that Israel's involved in the level and in countries around the world way beyond, in my view, the United States. And now I'm gonna finish up with this, just a real quick review of some of the weapons and technologies that Israel has developed in its war against the people. Surveillance. I mean, Israel has uh, uh, about a dozen satellites from different uh, series, spy satellites uh, uh, around the world, you know, that, uh, that orbit uh, you know, around the world and, and uh, especially in the Middle East, but not only in the Middle East, you know, survey what's happening, what's happening on the ground. Um, uh, one of them is, uh, is uh, uh, Techstar, um, uh, you know, the OFEC system and so on. <clears throat> Israel, of course, uh, is one of the world's leaders of drones. Uh, surveillance drones, but also militarized drones. This is a, a uh, an Elbit drone, the Hermes 450. There's a Hermes 900 as well, both of which are very active today in Gaza. Uh, and uh, Israel supplies 40% of the world's drones. And what's significant is, and there's all kinds of drones, and we'll see in a second, but a majority of the drones that are produced that are for surveillance and even weaponized drones are for police forces and not for military. So that says something. Um, <clears throat> uh, Israel has developed uh, um, AI targeting systems. And that's why it's, it, 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 you know, it, 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 it hit, I think, 250 targets yesterday 
in Gaza. It's hit something like 11,000 or targets in little tiny Gaza, which is the size of Omaha, Nebraska, by the way. Um, and it has a, what it's called the gospel, Hapsura, the alchemist, the depths of wisdom. These are AI targeting systems that not only identify, you know, they take all, there's a platform in which all the information from all the units of the Israeli army, from 8200, which is its very famous surveillance unit, to the Shin Bet, to the military intelligence, to army units on the ground, every single unit that, that gathers data, including soldiers in Hebron that are gathering data all the time on taking pictures of Palestinians, building databases on Palestinians, all that's fed into the system. And then through AI, not only are targets identified by who you want to attack uh, or, or, or what objective you have, but the system generates targets. The system says, according to your parameters, these are the places you should be attacking. And they, and they produce more targets every day than the Israeli army can attack. So that, so that uh, you know, again, these are super sophisticated systems, uh, you know, not only surveillance, but these kinds of targeting systems based on AI. Drones take all different kinds of shapes. Uh, these are called uh, uh, mini UAVs. You know, they're trying to, to mimic uh, insects and birds. Uh, this is a drone. How's this for a drone? You know, the size of a mosquito. If you can see, there's very sophisticated Elbit cameras that are the eyes. And this still goes together with a whole other field that Israel is pioneering, that other countries, it's now the, the, the area most funded by the Pentagon, which is nanotechnology, which is a form of military uh, uh, technologies that we're really not very familiar with. But are but are that a thousand times more deadly than nuclear bombs, and you could take nano is 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 the size of a molecule, so you could take uh, a, a drop of um, a poison, put it in this little tiny mosquito. You see, he has kind of a uh, a little needle, you know, coming out of the nose or the mouth or whatever, and you could put anthrax. And this little tiny mosquito could put enough anthrax in a water supply to poison the entire city based on one drop of nano uh, density uh, poisoned water. So that, you know, the, the, I mean, it's just infinite, the, 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 the amount of thought that's going into these deadly kinds of systems that we can't possibly know ourselves or communicate to the wider public. Of course, Israel is a again is a world leader in cyber warfare. Its Unit 8200 is very famous uh, and attacks you know these kinds of uh, Stuxnet and Duku and frame, Flame were the kinds of uh, malware that they installed in uh, in Iranian systems. This is also you know part of the future warfare. Not to mention, of course, all the surveillance technologies, the spyware that goes into our, into our telephones. We know the famous NSO story of Pegasus, the Saudi uh, journalist Khashoggi, who was uh, who was killed in uh, who was identified by the Saudis in in Turkey through an NSO um, phone tap. Uh, when uh, there was a, a whole, hundreds of journalists got together in a project to investigate NSO, they found that it's Peg it's Pegasus system that is spyware that goes into your phone. And you don't have to pick up your phone. It, 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 it can take everything out of your phone without you knowing it at all. They found it in the phones of 50,000 journalists throughout the world. Uh, all kinds of surveillance on the West Bank, uh, these red wolf, blue wolf systems, and so on that Amnesty has written about. And of course, all this is for export with all kinds of uh, safe city technologies you have in the United States. Here's something that's just interesting. Look at the surveillance industry in the world, where it's located. That says something about what parts of the world want to survey 
and control what other parts of the world. Uh, and of course, the checkpoints are places where Israel develops biometric surveillance devices and so on. Robotics. Israel has on the border of Gaza, for example, these kinds of, uh, of weapon stations that are all remote controlled, um, you know, in terms of both surveillance, but also in terms of these automatic weapons uh, firing, controlled ironically by uh, mainly by women soldiers in observation. And these women soldiers, I don't know if you heard the stories, uh, were observing what Hamas was doing in Gaza. They're right at the border. And they said for months, Hamas is planning a huge attack. We can see them organizing in front of our eyes. And because they were women soldiers, and because what they were saying didn't always appear on their high tech, the army's high tech stuff, they didn't believe them. And what, so all this high tech doesn't always help. The Guardian, which is a kind of a remote tank, uh, remote uh, uh, guns and other forms of weaponry, nanotechnology, I'm not going to get into it, but this is a super important thing we should know about. And also part of this whole thing is, again, the matrix of population control. Like, I'm not going to explain this, but this map of Israel's matrix of control of the West Bank, which is physical barriers, checkpoints, uh, walls, uh, highways, settlements, uh, a whole legal system that enables this military uh, uh, bases and so on. And this is exportable. Israel can export its matrix of control over the Palestinian territories to any other part of the world it wants to be. And finally, militarized policing. Um, you know, this is again battle space. Um, and again, the creation of insecurity. You know, all the insecurities and the wars on, wars on terror, the war on drugs, the war, you know, these are the are the metaphors that we use to induce insecurity in all of us. Uh, in the world in general, in the Western world, in the uh, in the in the global north, you you have a separation of the military and domestic security. There's a wall, a firewall, in a sense. You know, the CIA is not a, not allowed to communicate with the FBI, except through certain channels. Israel is trying to change that. This is part of the security state, and is trying to say no. The military and the security and the policing have to be really much more integrated. And you can see in the Israeli system, these are all the units that are paramilitary, para-police uh, units in the police force. This is a part of the security state that Israel is urging on the U.S., plus police weaponry like corner shots that can shoot around corners so policemen are not and SWAT teams are not exposed. The Uzi submachine gun, the Israel weapons industry that produces it, the most popular submachine gun with the mafia, not only military in the world, is produced now in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, in an IWI manufacturing plant. And, and the military weaponry is being uh, adapted to police use. So this is uh, uh, an Uzi submachine gun in a portable size you can put into a holster. Uh, <clears throat> again, drones. Uh, that are used by police forces that uh, in all kinds of forms. Uh, Non-lethal technologies repression like the skunk uh, um, uh, uh, crowd control uh, spray that Israel developed. And of course, then that again gets into all our lives, airport security. I mean, Israel Israel's security is, is, is in most American airports and so on. So finally, just, I'm sorry, I, I did talk. <laughs> but let's go back to our question. How does Israel get away with it? Well, I think we're beginning to get the, an idea. And of course, then, of course, everybody loves Israel, right? Because, uh, because we can, we, we present this as all, hey, this is all good stuff. We're making you all secure. And, uh, and that's how Israel, uh, uh, I would say, gets away with it. So sorry I talked so long, but I hope that, you know, it's just something you can't put into a sound bite, but I think it's very important to put all this within a global context.
Are you all stunned or trying Thank to Thank you, <laughs> Jeff. I, uh, <laughs> that was a lot to take in, wasn't it, everybody? Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, you warned me you had a lot to say, and you certainly did. I uh, did. And, and I thank you. I thank you deeply. That was quite a, a lesson that you gave us all. Um, we are going to have questions and answers for those of you who want to stick around. I know this is getting long, but we can hang out. I think you realize that for Jeff, this is, uh, what is it there, 12, 13 now, a.m. in the morning, Jeff? Yeah. So uh, thank you for sticking with us. <laughs> He's in Jerusalem. Thank you for sticking with me. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we want to take just a tiny break, and what we have taken up to do in the past uh, number of sessions is have an action. Every time we have a webinar, we ask people to get online and send a message out while we're here. It just takes a second. And in order to do that, uh, our friend and colleague Brian Garvey is going to talk to us here. So Brian, over to you. Thank you very much, Ken. and. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for joining us and for staying up late. I have to say, you get a lot of energy for it being after midnight uh, over there. So yeah, it was a pleasure to, to listen to that. Um, like Ken said, we always do. Uh, I, I work for an organization called Massachusetts Peace Action. I'm very proud that action is in our name. Uh, and we like to take this community education, thank you, Jeff, uh, and turn it into advocacy. Um, so, uh, Arlene asked a good question. Uh, what can what can ordinary citizens do uh, about this? Well, one thing that we can do uh, in this country is we can complain to our representatives and we can demand, make demands of them. Um, so we have created an action. Uh, if you click the link that I just put in the chat. Uh, the Congress is now considering a package which will give around $15 billion uh, to Israel. Much of that is military aid. Uh, much of that is replenishing uh, U.S. supplies of weapons that we have already transferred to Israel. That also includes funding uh, uh, for Ukraine. It includes uh, funding to militarize our own southern border even more. Um, so if you disapprove of the plan to give more tax money, these are these these are your dollars that you pay to the US government in the form of taxes. Uh, if you don't approve of them being sent uh, to rearm Israel as it commits a genocide in Gaza or to Lengthen the war in Ukraine, which is by their own admission uh, of military figures in Ukraine, a bloody stalemate. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to militarize our southern border uh, oh, to, to weaponize uh, uh, folks who are seeking asylum, uh, then please um, take action. Uh, complain to your representatives and let them know that, uh, that you vote on these issues. Speaker. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's easy to do. I just did mine, Brian, while you were speaking. And uh, so the link is there. If you can click on it and, and do that action, that's great. We have uh, 200, over 200 people with us still. Thank you for hanging in there, everybody. And um, I thought they'd be down to 20 by now. <laughs> <laughs> we still got a big number here. Uh, okay, so the way we're going to do the questions and answers, I might triage it a little bit, um, and we won't take too long because it, uh, you know, it's gotten to be long already. Um, but what we'll do is, if you do the reaction button at the bottom and raise your hand, you know, electronically raise your hand, like looks like Victoria Best. If it's not Victoria on camera, maybe, but somebody there, you go. You see hands coming up now. So, uh, so I would ask you to please be brief in your comments and um, to do have a question, uh, not just, you know, not just a comment. If you can have a question for Jeff to respond to, that would be great. And uh, we'll go for, let's try for 15 minutes and see where we are after that. Um, okay, so uh, Victoria Best, you're first, go ahead. Gotta unmute yourself. 
There we go. Uh, hi, it's uh, Charles Fredericks. Um, I, <clears throat> I met you briefly uh, and uh, co-produced, co-directed the movie with Joseph Avasar a while back. Uh, I wonder if you could for a moment speak to, especially in current circumstances, what we're witnessing is the, uh, the delegitimizing of the, the, uh, the ideological perspective of, of you know, Israel. And I would add to that the United States and in Ukraine um, and how this makes the people the enemy of the state, but it also, you know, it delegitimizes the state themselves. So, I mean, the only, the only uh, window that I see of a possible uh, silver lining to this is that these non-human based ideologies are failing due to their own, uh, you know, internal contradictions. Could you, could you say what you think the current situation in Israel is participate is contributing to that? If you see it that way. In terms of, uh, uh, Dele delegitimizing the, right. the ability, the ability of Israel right. to maintain its perspective, you know, worldwide is based on a myth, right. you know, as is America's. Right. No, I think that's, uh, that's, you know, certainly happening. I, I mean, from my point of view, the, the great, great uh, contribution of the George Bush, the son's administration was that I think he really exposed the way capitalism works and its, and, 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 uh, and, and its failings in a sense uh, and its brutality in a way that no other, no other president had done or anybody else had done before. Um, you know, I think now, I think people are really, I think understand it now. You know, a lot of people that aren't academics or that are on the left or, or activists, I think a lot of people understand. And I think in Israel too, uh, you know, this has really been traumatic for Israel uh, not only in terms of what's happened, but also in terms of the fact that there is no victory. There is no, I, I, you know, there, there's no way you can win. There's no revenge you can get that, 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 you know, it's also pointless in a sense. And I think Israelis are beginning to say, where are we going with this whole thing? Is it all sustainable? And so on. I think the big, so I think that's true. I think Israel uh, and uh uh, in all kinds of, uh, in all, you know, I think the Iraq war and Afghanistan contributed to that. The problem is that we're not offering alternatives. And I think that's the problem. I think where the right wins is that they're presenting to the world, to the, the public, a coherent ideology or worldview um, or explanations of how the world works, including Trump. You know, he's actually very good at that in his language. We're, you know, we, we don't really do that. We don't have forums in which we can, in which we can really uh, get together in all our silos. We're very siloed. We're very competitive with, with each other. We don't let people become leaders because we're not supposed to be hierarchical. I think the whole idea of Nomi Klein, of a leaderless revolution, is nonsense in my, from my, from my, from my view. You know, maybe as an old 60s person that dates me, we have to organize and we have to organize around a political program. That's one reason why I, I spend so much time on this tonight, because unless we can we can somehow I mean, we don't have an hour and a, and a quarter on TV or the radio or wherever to explain this to people. We have to find ways to 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 get this across to people, but not only in terms of the military. But all the other issues, the climate change issues, a million other issues, and we're not doing that very well. So I think really it's on us to begin to, to organize better, to begin to communicate better, and really to begin to develop what I consider an eco-socialist future for the world that is the only way to go, just like I think a one democratic state solution is the only solution for Palestine Israel, certainly not two states. Um, but we have to be articulate that and we have to be able to organize around it to really become political players. And that's where I feel as, as an Israeli activist that we've failed. We haven't gone beyond protests. We're very good at writing. We're very articulate. We do all our analyses and so on. But we're not political players like the right wing are. The settlers, man, they're out there. 
they're out there all the time and they're they're and they're doing stuff and they're they're succeeding and we're you know it's frustrating in, in some ways but i think i think in a sense the mask has been has been lowered and people see the monster that that exists today in the world but um but we're not able to really mobilize on that and i think that's something we should be talking about more is there any i just want to say by the way i just want to say one thing i'm willing to share all these slides with anybody that wants them i mean i think they're you know if you find them useful or some of them useful whatever you know if you write to me i don't know where maybe info at icad i-c-a-h-d israeli committee against house demolitions.org I'm happy to, to send them to you. So, you know, Jeff, I produce them in order to get them out. Jeff, let me tell you that I always send a follow up email out with the recording of this session. And, mm -hmm. if, and I will send, if you send me the link to your slides, I'll send it out. And not only goes to the people that are here, but our entire mailing list gets it. So, um, if you are, if you feel like you can send me the link to the slides, do mm -hmm. that and I'll send it out in the follow up. Okay. So, let's go to, thank you, uh, Charles. And let's go to, we have a few more questions, see if we can get them in here fairly quickly. Cheryl Hogan, no you, Cheryl, hi. Hi, hi Ken, Cheryl. and hi, Jeff. And um, boy, that's not my first time hearing your presentation and it is equally depressing every time, but thank God for resistance and the Palestinians are good at that. Uh, and I don't mean armed resistance, I mean just the, the spirit uh, of resistance that is very alive. And I guess it'll always be alive when people are oppressed. I'd like you to ask, uh, talk to you, or pardon me, I'd like you to talk about Cop City because that's another situation which very much depresses me and worries me. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, could you please uh, put that in the context of what you've been saying? Thank you. I, I'm not really that familiar with, I know very, very vaguely about it, but I haven't really, kept up on it. So I, I, I don't know if I could really do that. Um, I haven't really, I, I don't think I know enough about it to, to express an opinion. Let me so, just add for the benefit of our audience that Cop City in Atlanta is, uh, has been going on for over a year now where the a foundation there is establishing a training center for urban warfare and they already have Israeli training of their police forces. And uh, there's quite a resistance, has been quite a resistance. We had, uh, if you look at our WERN, our War Industry Resistors Network uh, webinar uh, recordings, which is on our website, we had one particularly about Cop City. And it uh, was really informative. A couple activists from Atlanta talked to us about it. So it fits, completely into what Jeff is talking about, the militarization of policing and the repression of opposition and dissent. Uh, so I would uh, advise people um, to go look at that webinar, go to our WERN website under webinars and you'll find the recording there. I don't know if this is connected, but on the state in Atlanta, on the, the campus of Georgia State University is uh, what's called the Gilly Center. I don't know if this is part of the uh, of the cop uh, uh, city uh, project. The Gilly Center is um, I don't know the, the Georgia International Law Exchange or something like that. But it, it's it's an Israeli run police training program in the United States, funded by the the guy that started Bernie. What's his name that started Home Center? Uh, he's he's one of the main funders. It brings American police to Israel, and it's an, it's an Israeli police training center on the campus of Georgia State in Atlanta. Uh, it's a black cube. No one can go in. You're not, students have no access. You know, they've tried to get access to the curriculum, who's teaching there, what's going on on their campus, and, and can't do it. And it's one of three other Israeli police training academies that, that exists in the United States. So, I, uh, you know, that part I do know because I've, I've tried to get into that place actually. Thank you, Cheryl, for bringing that, making that connection mm -hmm. for us. 
Okay, so we are going to have more questions here than we have time for, but let's keep going. Eleanor Levine, let's, let's have you up next. Hi. Um, you can't see me, but I'm here. Um, mm -hmm. I Can you, there was so much information that you presented today that I'm very overwhelmed. So could you say, pick out three or four of the points you think are essential or the highlights of what you presented today? You know. Well, all right, in, in a sentence, just to ask, answer the question, how does Israel get away with it? You know, uh, I, I began to look at this because, you know, usually we say Israel gets away with it because Congress supports Israel. And that's certainly true. I mean, Israel can do, you know, Israel's defying Biden. It, 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 it doesn't do anything the United States wants it to do um, because it has Congress behind it. And why does it have Congress behind it? Because uh, uh, members of Congress believe that they're not going to get elected if they're critical of Israel, unless you're Rashid Tlaib from Dearborn. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and, uh, and therefore, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's a Jewish lobby in the Democratic Party that's responsible for Israel getting away with it because they control the Democratic Party or the Christian evangelicals, the religious right to control the Republican Party. And Israel is, is covered in, in, in both ways. Uh, but that just didn't, I mean, it made sense in the United States to some degree, but that doesn't explain the rest of the world. You don't have a big Jewish community in China that is fairly supportive of Israel as well. So there was something bigger and more universal going on. And that's what led me to, to, to follow the threads in terms of Israel's military involvement. So I would say Israel gets away with it for two reasons. One is, as I said, it's, it's become a key enforcer of the global uh, uh, capitalist system, um, you know, uh, doing things that, that that the militaries of the global north are not capable of doing. And secondly, it's become uh, uh, the major supplier and trainer of uh, repressive regimes all over the world that, that, uh, that are trying to keep their own rest of populations under control. So population control, whether it's global or, uh, or localized, securitization, pacification, those are exactly the, the, the skills of Israel. And that's what it's learned from 100 years of war against the Palestinians. It has the technologies, it has the weaponry for it, uh, and it has the tactics and the models for that kind of population control that's exportable to anywhere. And in short, that was sort of my, my message. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jeff. Um, Okay, so I can see six hands held up in the air. And uh, let's do this. Let's do, um, let's say two rounds of three questions. We'll get three people to say their questions before we get Jeff to respond. And Jeff, maybe you can remember the three questions and uh, try to get it in. <laughs> yeah, good, that's a good idea. <laughs> Write it down. Uh, so let's do Lindsay, Cam, and Samir first, and then we'll do the next three and we'll call it quits after that. So let's get your questions and, uh, and then get Jeff to answer three at a time. Okay, so, should I start? Yes, please. Okay, I'm in North Carolina um, and I am a political, I'm trying really hard to get political. Well, you guys are too, but. I really would like senators, the senators to call for a ceasefire, both Ted Tillis and Bud. Um, I'm of course hitting a boilerplate, you know, brick wall of just nonsense. I wondered if you guys had any advice for me, how I could be more effective in terms of speaking with members of Congress or with the Senate in terms of really trying to compel them to go for ceasefire, or if you think it's completely a waste of time and it's not gonna, they are not gonna be agents of change um, as far as what my goal is at the moment, which is I would just like to see if first thing is a ceasefire on the Gazan population and for the violence to stop in the West Bank. So realistically, you guys are much more experienced than I am. I'm very new to this. I want to know what's actually possible politically in North Carolina with converting them to a ceasefire position. Um, and if you had any insight as to how I could maybe speak to them or 
try to engage them in a way to convince them. Good. Thank you, Lindsay. And Cam Wilson, your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay, so I want to know how it is that AOC in the U.S. Congress and um, and her uh, the the about eight different ones of them sent a letter calling for a ceasefire, and then they they pulled it back and said, "Sorry, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have uh, been so forward." And I want to know how they are controlled. Who is that that controls them so badly that they can't even send a letter asking for a ceasefire? Okay, thank you, Cam. And uh, third question, Samir, please go ahead. Yes. Hi, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Jeff, uh, for the lecture. Uh, my question is, how come with all of these Israeli technologies you just mentioned, on October 7th, Hamas was able to break through it? That's my question. Okay, thank you, Samir. There you go, Jeff, over to you. Well, I think, uh, you know, maybe the first the first two questions are kind of connected about the ceasefire and, uh, and why AOC and the others pull back from a call to a ceasefire. Um, you know, the ceasefire is, is I mean, it's, it's, it's crucial. I mean, I mean, there really is a, uh, you know, it's approaching genocide, what's happening in Gaza. I mean, it's way beyond what uh, simply going after Hamas. Or, I mean, yeah, it, it, matter of fact, the spokesperson uh, for the Israeli army said that, uh, that um, you know, we're killing two civilians uh, for every one uh, Hamas uh, fighter. And, uh, and, that, and that's a great proportion, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, so that, um, there's not even a pretense, you know, that Israel is trying to protect the civilian population or this is a precise military. I mean, it's true with all the, the technologies like the AI uh, targeting system that Israel has, there's no reason why it has to drop uh, these huge bunker buster bombs, not on Hamas tunnels, but on the Jabalia refugee camp twice and create craters in residential areas. So there's a, there's an there's an attempt. I mean, genocide is defined partly as the intent to destroy a people in whole or in part, and I think what Israel is doing is that intent. Uh, I don't know if all this really matters to the American uh, uh, senators and and representatives. I wish it did. A lot of them tell me, you know, plainly, you know, we know. We agree. I had a talk, I'll tell you, last week with Senator Heinrich from, uh, from New Mexico, who is actually very engaging, very forthcoming. He's very progressive. The New, the New Mexico people are really pushing him. But he, he isn't going to go there yet. I mean, he's, you know, calling for a ceasefire. I think these guys are afraid of, uh, of um, not advancing in their own parties, you know. Partly, and I think they're also, uh, you know, concerned about getting reelected. I mean, Heinrich is in a more safe seat, maybe th than other people. And a lot of this has to do with Israel's successful weaponizing of anti-Semitism. You just had a whole uh, 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 session in the American Congress in the House of Representatives about about representation. This whole idea that criticizing Israel is anti-Semitism, and I think I think. Uh, I think people are intimidated, including the more progressives in the uh, in the Democratic Party are intimidated uh, by um, a by this this uh, weaponizing of anti-Semitism, and that's where I think one thing that might help is if you plugged in more into critical Israeli voices, me and some real Israelis that are born here and uh, and speak with an accent and so on. In terms of, uh, in a sense, legitimizing your criticism of Israel, um, but Israel has been very successful at that, um, supported by a lot of people in the Democratic Party as well, um, and so I think that that's part of the thing that explains that this weaponization of anti-Semitism. 
which isn't anti-Semitism. But, you, you know, one thing I just want to say is that, you know, it's Israel that's blurred that distinction between, um, between Israelis and Jews, you see. And Israel, and Netanyahu said the other day, you know, Israel is not a country of Israelis. It's a country of the Jewish people. Well, that makes Jews in the United States complicit. You know, so if Jews don't say, whoa, wait a minute, I'm not an Israeli. I didn't vote for you. I might agree with your policies or disagree, but you can't include me as an Israeli, not in my name, right? If they would do that and make a distance, then I don't believe there would be attacks on Jews in the U.S. I think the attacks on Jews are by people uh, who uh, who uh, kind of you know kind of accept. What Israel says is that all these people are Israelis. All Jews are Israelis. And when Jews go to Washington to support Israel in that demonstration and all wrap up in the flag of a foreign country, what's the message there? The message is, yes, we identify not just with that country. I mean, you can love Israel, whatever you want to do. But, you know, you, if you identify with genocidal a, 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 you know, a, 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 a genocidal assault on Gaza, and you accept the fact that 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 they're doing that in your name, and you're not saying no, not in my name. Then, in a sense, your cult, Israel is putting you in, in harm's way, but at the same time, you're also complicit in that. And that's where this anti-Semitism, you know, is intentionally Israel uses that. Uh, to uh, obviously to deflect any criticism of Israel, but if, if and and universities have adopted that, and 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 I think thirty some states in the United States have adopted this uh, uh, this uh, definition of anti-Semitism, that criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism, and if that happens, then of course people are going to uh, the Jewish community is in jeopardy, because the Jewish community is allowing itself to be co-opted by a foreign country with genocidal policies. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that, that we have to begin to, uh, and I can help with this, we have to begin to reframe this anti-Semitic kind of a thing to give space to people uh, in order to criticize Israel without being uh, uh, accused of anti-Semitism. Uh, in terms, Samir, of your question of, of October 7th, I mean, I'm not buying into all the conspiracy theories that that uh, the army didn't know and this and that. They were warned. I mean, Sisi warned Israel. They, they, like I said before, all these women, uh, these women soldiers uh, that, um, that were the observers were warning the military. I think what happened is a number of things. I think one is the arrogance. The army had a certain conception. We call it in Hebrew, a conceptia. They had a conception that Hamas uh, is not going to to fight Israel. That we bought them off. That in fact uh, they're going to become the governing authority. Netanyahu was talking about this all these last years. They'll become the governing authority, and uh, and uh, and therefore uh, they're not going to break the ceasefire that we have with them, and so on. There was a conception. So when these when these women soldiers told the intelligence services. What was going on? They didn't believe them because it didn't fit the conception. That's one thing. Military thinking is really more ideology than it is actual analysis of what uh, of a situation. The other thing is, I think low tech beat high tech. You know, Israel built a eight hundred million dollar, super sophisticated underground wall. Uh, people were coming from all over the world to see this miracle of engineering an underground wall in order to, pre to prevent Hamas from digging tunnels into Israel. But what they did is they put a, a $1.98 fence on top. And so Hamas on October 7th simply came through with pickup trucks and little simple bulldozers and in 25 different places broke through the fence and came in. I think it surprised Hamas too. Apparently, I don't know all the details, but the Hamas fighters 
didn't really know this was going to happen until they actually came for a training and they said, you're going in. So I think, was, and there was something else going on. And that is that, you know, we've got these crazy settlers in the government, Ben Gvir and Smotrich and these guys uh, that were re that are really heating up the West Bank. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, in this Jewish holiday, uh, 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 they were doing a whole um, a ceremony in Huara, which is a, a Palestinian town on the West Bank. And uh, um, 23 of the 27 uh, units of the Israeli army were in the West Bank, defending the settlers, holding, the, you know, controlling the Palestinians. Only four units were on the Gaza border. The Gaza unit was in Hawara that day. And so I think it was a combination of things, a kind of a weird combination that allowed this to happen. I don't believe, even though they did know, but you know, you don't always act and uh, you know, on what you know, uh, you know, I don't believe that it was obviously that, that the army allowed it to happen. I mean, it was humiliating for Israel, for the army. And if you look at the Israel military industry, that's based on surveillance and its effectiveness and so on, that certainly doesn't help its market. In other words, Israel had nothing to gain by somehow sitting back and allowing Hamas uh, to come in. So I don't, that just doesn't make any sense to me. And I think what happened were these, these combinations of things that, that allowed this thing to happen uh, against everybody's expectations. That's at least my view. Ken, you're muted. Um, yeah, we can't hear you, Ken. Sorry. Uh, so I see three more hands. We're going to call it quits after that. And uh, let's get those three questions on the table here. Claudia, go ahead. Uh, yes. Hi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. For, it's always uh, very inspiring and, and compelling for me to listen to what you have to say and how you articulate the global issues uh, you know, corporate capitalism and so on with, with the smaller instances of manifestations of this the process. A, a couple of questions was, you mentioned several times like the far right. And I'd like to ask you about the role, what do you make of the role of the, I don't, I don't know whether to call it left, progressive, whatever, but say, and, 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 and maybe, you know, Obama would be an example, but that's a bit extreme, but there are other forces on the traditional progressive left that join forces with this corporate class knowingly or not to wage uh, the, 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 this construct, this very compelling construct war against the people in a variety of settings, not just war, but uh, technologies of surveillance of population, you know, just, okay, of course you take off your shoes because otherwise the terror, or, you know, you allow your digital or QR code or, you know, all these surveillance mechanisms of controlling population movement, right? Uh, so what do you make of that role? And my understanding of the history is that it played a huge role the, 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 in, in, in the history of, England, of, of Israel itself, like within Israel, right? Uh, so um, sometimes I, I feel a bit sort of, you know, uncomfortable when I hear the right, because I see it around the left, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. very much so. And I felt very uh, repressed myself, like in, disabled to speak or even shunned for speaking up among, you know, so-called left groups or progressive groups. That's one thing. And the other quick question would be, if I may, is to, um, to uh, ask you, you said that it's not possible that Israel would, you know, I, I don't mean do it on purpose, but would have nothing to gain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I come up with the example of say 9-11 in the US. I'm in Canada now, but I was in the US at that time. But also in Canada, that actually, uh, you, one could argue incoherently, but it actually propelled the surveillance industry, right? Even if it showed a tremendous failure, uh, presumably, assuming that the that the story, the official story is truth, and that is questionable. But anyway, the point I want to make is that even if it may have shown its failure, it it, it launched it 
like a, for several factors, right? Uh, and now, uh, you know, beyond taking off your shoes, you have to do all kinds of things. So sometimes you have these contradictory results, right? I wonder to what extent that wasn't true, uh, you know, of the September 11, uh, the September, I'm sorry, the October 7 event. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but thank you anyway. Thank you, Claudia. Um, and uh, who is it next? Emoji, Aga? See if we can make a quick couple of questions here. The hour's getting late. Go ahead, Moji. Uh, Moji, you're muted. Um, hmm. Are you there, Moji? There you go. Oh, okay. Uh, it said that, that the host is not allowing me to open my mic. Hi, and Thank you very much, Jeff, for your very informative talk. I am an Iranian-American peace and human rights and democracy activist. And as you were talking, I was listening to a, to a clubhouse room from inside Iran talking about the regime and the abuses of power of the regime inside Iran. And I was hearing part of you and part of them. And I was here, wow, this is exactly the same thing. And that, um, I'm going to send you the link to a speaking tour uh, called, called Peace and Truth Heals Speaking Tour I'm going to have. And, uh, and the, the link is there. The, the point that I wanted to ask a question about is the, the, the regime in Iran, and I'll try to make this quick, the regime in Iran and the Israeli regime, they need one another as enemy. And it's like, you know, when Israel created Hamas in order to make the conflict into a religious one, and the regime in Iran that claims to be Islamic loves it. So they need one another as enemy, as Dr. Mossadegh, Iran's you know, secular democratic prime minister who was overthrown by the CIA and MI6 with the help of the newly created state called Israel, he was overthrown. He said in one of his uh, most you know, enduring legacies is that internal despotism and external colonialism are two sides of the same coin. They need one another, in other words, either as friends or as enemies. So my question to you is how as peace and nonviolence and human rights and democracy activists, how do we deal with conflicts in which both sides of the so-called uh, conflict need one another as enemy. Thank well, you. Okay, thank you, Moji. And last question, Stephanie Hiller, please go ahead. That was a question. Stephanie Hiller, are you there? Yes, to unmute. Unmute, Stephanie. It was for a second there. There you go. Mm, she keeps muting herself. I don't know what's going on. Can you unmute, Stephanie? There you go. Your question for Jeff? This will be the last question. Yeah, I can't hear her. Um, for some reason, your microphone's not working, Stephanie. Um, I'm thinking, can you write it in the chat, Stephanie, your question in the chat, maybe. And Jeff, if you want to go ahead and uh, answer the first two, let's do that. You're muted, Jeff. You're muted, Jeff. Uh, can we get copies of the chat as well? I mean, a lot of people are are writing to me, but I can't I can't read it. Obviously, I'd like to get a copy if I could. 
Yeah, Brian will, Brian's putting thumbs up. He can do that for us. All right, okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know exactly what to say about the first uh, point. I mean, it depends what we mean by left and progressives and liberals. I mean, we all know those of us that were radicals um, before bin Laden captured that term, um, I always thought that liberals were a, more of a problem than conservatives, you know, uh, because liberals, uh, you know, they're a part of the, they're, they're really the main, uh, 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 you know, gatekeepers or watchers of the system. I mean, they're the ones that benefit almost the most in the system. And so they, they criticize lightly and they're, and they're uh, you know, they try to be liberal. Uh, and sometimes progressive and so on, but not to the degree that they're going to change the system in any way. And that's really the the problem we face, uh, I think, between the left and the liberals, is that we really want to try to change the system. But we're, you know, I guess in general, critical people are very few in number. I mean, you don't learn to be critical in school, certainly. I mean, everybody, I I, I think every critical person has his or her own story of how he or she became critical. It isn't just something that that, that happens to massive numbers of people. And so, uh, and so some people are more liberal, obviously, in their opinions, but not to the point where they're really going to, to spend the time, you know, like we did tonight, to really understand the system and and then commit themselves to changing the system because they're they're the the middle classes for the most part, or the upper middle classes. Maybe when they're kids, and this is maybe the hope in the next generation, not so much a hope out of non-hope, when their kids begin to feel as they are more excluded and not having a role in the, in the system that exists, uh, maybe they'll, in fact, begin to join us in terms of wanting to change the system. But then, of course, we have to take the lead to some degree in terms of giving people a direction on how are we going to change, what, what, what is our vision? What is our what's the alternative system that we're presenting? So people have, even if people are, you know, would like to leave the unsustainable system they're in, they don't know where to go exactly. And we have to sort of uh, help that process. So I guess uh, uh, you know, maybe we should look at an alliance in the future between ourselves and the children of the liberals who are going to be pushed more and more into the left, but are going to need somewhere to go that we can help. In terms of the second question, I think, um, uh, you know, it's a hard question to ask about meeting enemies. Look, let me just say this, you know, and I know it's getting late, not so late for you guys, but it's, not, it's only six. I mean, for me, it's one in the morning. For me, it's getting late, but it's fine. But, so I don't want to get into a whole, a whole thing again, but I think there's something about the international system. I was thinking of talking about it tonight, and then I thankfully didn't. Um, and that is that, you know, the question is partly, why can't we make the world a better place? What's, what's the problem here? Um, and the problem is that we, the people, I mean, the people you were talking to in the clubhouse, or us, the people tend to talk in terms of things that matter, justice, you know, well-being, freedom, uh, right, you know, those sorts of things, uh, you know, because that, that affects our lives. But government, international relations, as we know, and I think I'm writing about it because I think it's something we have to think and write about more, is done on a completely transactional level. I mean, Trump was the epitome of transactional international relations, but Biden and, you know, all these other guys today, I think are, are, are the same in a, in a capitalist world where you know, Biden is running for office and Saudi Arabia is going to be a pariah state and two years later, he's giving nuclear weapons to Saudi Arabia. So in a transactional, the problem with the transactional uh, international system is there are no values. There are no alliances. There are no partners. There's no long-term strategy. Um, there's no commitments. There's no international law. There's no international rules that Biden likes to talk about all the time. It's all it's all deals, you know, short term deals. You know, I have an inflation problem. 
where am I going to get oil? So I have a green agenda, but I'm going to go drill oil. Or I'm going to go run to Saudi Arabia so they increase their production. Everything is short-term, immediate, and again, with no values whatsoever. So there's a disconnect between us and the government. We're, we're, we're just not talking at all. So governments don't, you know, Jimmy Carter was laughed out of office because he tried to make human rights a guiding, uh, a guiding uh, 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 you know, set of values for American foreign policy. And he was, he, he's considered one of the worst presidents, partly because of that. He was laughed out by Reagan and these guys. So that's the problem we're facing. These governments that, that run on, these, on this transactional level that just aren't, um, they just don't speak our language. And therefore, you know, the, you know, they need useful enemies because everything isn't really, they don't really care about, you know, they're, they're just trying to create these straw men in a way in order to create wars or create conflicts or create conditions that, that advance their agenda, whatever the, the economic agenda or whatever. And it's very hard for us to, to control that. So one of the questions we have to ask ourselves again as the left is how do we, as the people, affect government policy when we simply have nothing in common to talk about, no, no way of thought. I, and I think that gets back to the first question, you know, about, about, or the question about Congress. People in Congress are transactional. And I don't think value, all these things don't really matter to them and therefore they're kind of out of our reach. And I think that's something we should, uh, we should explore and, and we should try to, uh, uh, to come up with some ways, some strategies of how to, of how to deal with that. Okay, <laughs> now this is the last question <laughs> and it's actually a good one for a last question. This is Stephanie, she's writing in the chat. She says, I wanna know how you feel, Jeff living in Israel and speaking about this powerful global system. There you go. What do you say to that? Well, I'm very isolated. I mean, um, obviously, according to the last poll, 94% of Israelis support what the government is doing in Gaza. 94%. And that, that includes, you know, the intellectuals and professors and the journalists and all the people that write the satirical programs on TV, you know, and it's really something about how, you know, in, a, in, in an open society, I mean, there's libraries, the, the internet, you know, uh, the people are university educated here, half the population goes abroad every summer. And in that kind of a society that you can get 94% of the people to agree on anything, not to mention a genocidal attack on Gaza. Whoa, something is 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 you know is is going on in terms of the power of the ideology and the paradigms of Zionism and and you know the way they're feeding us these kinds of uh, of ideologies. Beyond that, of course, I feel isolated also because uh, I've been trying very much, and I don't know. I just throw this out to you guys at this hour. I've been trying very much to work over the years in terms of organizing the left. Now the left, it can't be organized. We're a herd of cats, we'll never be organized, we'll never accept each other's leadership, we'll never accept each other's agenda, we have trouble talking to each other. But I think we could begin to provide an infrastructure to the left, a kind of a network that, that groups all over the world could begin to plug into. And uh, I've developed a whole uh, proposal called the People Yes Network. <laughs> Comes out of a poem by Carl Sandburg. You know, this epic poem, The People Yes, about how the working people built the world, not the Napoleons and the great people of history and so on. And the People Yes Network, and I have, but I haven't been able to sell it to anybody. And I know left people all over the world. Being based in Israel is, is very difficult. I mean, to be an old white man and an Israeli to boot is not your ticket into the global left. Uh, and so I have very good relations with people, but I, and there's no real organization or group of people that, that would take this on. The only group I can think of, the only organization I can think of, if you know it, 
is that this is what's called the Tricontinental Institute of uh, Vijay Prashad. And he's one of the few that is really trying to deal with these global issues. But unfortunately, his institute is subtitled of social research, <laughs> not, the, not of social action. And so I've tried to approach him and I haven't succeeded. And I don't know if there are other organizations or networks that are really that are really committed to trying to build an infrastructure for the global left that can be a kind of a, of a network and a framework for us to, uh, to, to work through. I'm happy to send my proposal to anybody that's interested. I'm throwing this out. But I think that's, that's really where I, where I feel, you know, when people say, you know, you know, don't you get frustrated or hopeless after all these years and nothing's really changed and done yeah, you know, the answer is no. What makes me hopeless, I don't like the word hopeless. It's, it's a struggle. The hope has nothing to do with it. But what makes me, I guess, sometimes feel disempowered is when, when we're not, when we know what we should be doing and we have the analyses and we have the people, the, 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 the critical mass of people, and we can't organize. And we end up doing a big rally of 500,000 people that are ephemeral because two weeks later, nobody remembers them. And we have, uh, you know, or we do protests or we do, and we're not organized and we're not, and, and we're not political players. The left is not a political player. And maybe we see ourselves as gadflies, as a marginal, and we don't expect to be in positions of power or influence like the right wing does. But, but, but that's, I think, what, if, if anything, that's what really makes me feel isolated. And then again, being in Israel <laughs> uh, uh, adds to that as well. But, but uh, nevertheless, I'm very engaged. And, uh, and evenings like this, where I can meet 200 of you, or I don't know how many more are, will listen in the end, really, I think, is, is important. And I think uh, this is part of the conversation we all have to be having both on the on the level of analysis, but certainly also on the level of, all right, what do we, so what? What are we, what are we gonna do about it? How are we really gonna move our collective agendas forward? So I wanna thank, you know, the Mass uh, uh, Peace Action Group and, uh, and Ken and people in North Carolina and all of you for inviting me and having the patience to listen to me for so long. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jeff. That was so great, and uh, and yeah, we'll uh, we send this recording is live streamed on YouTube. We send the recording out in a follow up email. We have an email list of about two thousand. We then put the recording on our website, and um, so hopefully this gets a big reach, and uh, it certainly is worth it. We certainly appreciate you, and and uh, wish you well, and folks, wish you all well who are still with us this evening. We'll have another one in January. We don't have one lined up yet, but uh, it'll be something. And uh, so it's been a long evening. It's been well worth it, Jeff. Appreciate you the most. And uh, one o'clock in the morning, time for you to go to bed, brother. <laughs> all right. Thank you Bye, all. Everyone. Good.